marhaban wa ahlan bakum fi barnamij dakhil Washington. Makum mudifakum Robert Satloff. To ghayr et teknologiya hayatna daiman. Munduan ek tashafa an nas an nar wa ikhtara'u al ajla. Sara asai wa ra teknologiya afdal, asra wa adhka, andaf wa akhas, sa'ran wa akthar kifatan. Ahad el makhrakat et takadum el bashri. El natija el yom mujtama'a teknologiya el mustakbal bain idei el atfal el an. A teknologiya that tabea siyasi aidan. Hel yajdur behukumatna et tahakum fil internet. Hel yajdur behukuma daman el wusul el mutakafia il el internet lukul el mustakh lakin. Hel yajdur bel hukuma farad daribat al el internet. Hadihi baad min aham el asala haul el siyasa el ama fi baladna el yom. Lumunakasha siyaset et teknologiya fi Amerika. Yasurni anu rahib be wahid min zu ame el haraka li tak yid kidra el hukuma al tahakum fi teknologiya. Wa hua beren joka raiz munadama ismuha tech freedom. Welcome back to Dachel Washington. Today we're going to talk about a topic which is important to people around the world, the internet, the politics and policy making about it. Our guest is Baron Soka, the founder of Tech Freedom. Thank you for joining us here Thanks for on having Dachel me. Washington. So first, how important is the internet to the American economy? Well, incredibly important. It's about one seventh of the US economy and that's growing all the time. So. Internet policy issues used to be separate issues, but really they now touch upon every aspect of American life, from agriculture, for example, is being transformed by the Internet of Things. Tractors are starting to become Internet enabled, and that means that broadband de deployment in rural areas is becoming important. Everyone worries about privacy. Every company in America retains data about their users. Uh, how the government spies on its citizens and foreign citizens affects everyone. It's really becoming uh, an all-inclusive issue that touches really every debate in Washington. So there is a common perception that the internet, or it's almost a romantic idea that the internet is free and independent and unregulated. Is that accurate? Well, that idea is generally called internet exceptionalism, the idea that the internet is different. And that idea has gone through several phases. There were people in the 1990s who took a very strong version of that view. They declared back in 1996 that the internet was independent, that weary giants of flesh and steel, the, the governments of the industrial world, really had no ability, uh, let alone uh, should they, regulate the internet. And of course, that's not true. Of course, it is true that governments can regulate the internet in lots of ways. It's sometimes very difficult, and there are technologies like Bitcoin, which is a, a digital currency that is much more difficult for governments to regulate. That, that really are proving some of the points that the uh, internet exceptionalists of the 1990s made, that, that the internet is fundamentally changing things, that it breaks down barriers, that it, it changes our assumptions about what can be regulated, let alone what should be. But the, the truth is somewhere in the middle, and, and our role in debate is really to, uh, to, to provide some skepticism about the government's ability to, to regulate the internet, uh, to steer technology in better directions, and some optimism that, for the most part, technological change is good for all of us. So the, um, you, you answered in, in two ways. One about whether it, um, whether it is and can be regulated, and then secondly about whether it should be regulated. Uh, uh, you underscored the difficulty of regulating it, um, but should or shouldn't the government be involved in this world? Well, and indeed how. I mean, that, that in the end is probably the most important question, and there are lots of options for doing that and, and to frame the issues as broadly as possible. We often say that there are people who think that you should regulate the internet the same way that everything else was regulated. So Uber is a great example of this. So the taxi industry is a traditional model of regulation where you assume that the only way to protect consumers is to issue a license to every driver and to, to ration the number of, uh, of cabs out, out there and to control the prices they charge. 
Well, the internet comes along and totally blows up that model and allows uh, anyone in cities that are willing to allow it to hail a, a car that might be driven by somebody who does it full time. It might be a part time driver. And instead of regulating every aspect of how that works, technology does the regulation. Technology allows you, the passenger, to rate your driver, to give them four, five stars, three stars, depending on how you like the experience. The drivers rate you. And, and the system works much better that way because drivers who fall below, I think it's about 4.6 stars, they get kicked off of Uber's platform. So, so in other words, that's just an example of regulation changing. And so the government does have a role there. The government, for example, should make sure that Uber is not uh, deceiving its users. Uh, it may be that some of its practices are not uh, so harmful as to be unfair. But the role for the government is not the traditional role of traditional taxi regulation based on essentially the same model we applied to railroads and canals and toll bridges going back to the Middle Ages. So that, that, that's just an illustration of how uh, we think technology changes the debate and really breaks it out of a, a simple yes, no, should the government regulate into something a lot more complex and, and how should the government regulate. And, and in many cases, the, the best answer is require transparency it, make sure that companies are being honest uh, and let the market work from there. And if there are real problems, real failures, focus on those instead of assuming in advance that markets won't work. One of the big debates in, uh, um, uh, in this world in America for going back now years is uh, uh, regarding taxation, um, commerce on the internet and whether and how it should be taxed by different authorities. Um, or should this be a mode of, of commerce that should be open, um, uh, untaxed? And, uh, what are the arguments? Well, the U.S. has been extending its uh, Permanent Internet Tax Freedom Act, a ban on internet taxes, uh, since the 1990s. It keeps coming up every few years. Congress keeps extending it. And I think that's mostly right. Uh, a lot of the problem today is really for small businesses. Uh, the, the practical challenges of trying to figure out how to tax purchases in a country like America where you have 50 different states. We don't have a national sales tax, of course. Uh, every state has different taxes. And then localities have different taxes. So you might live in one county in a particular state and you might pay a different rate from what the next county over pays. And that becomes a very difficult practical challenge for figuring out how much tax you should charge and who you're charging it to for online purchases. So the answer thus far has been to not require uh, that kind of taxation. Congress has been trying to figure out uh, ways to make it simple. I think there are some. You could, for example, require that uh, when you make a, a purchase online, that the uh, place you're buying the good from the store pay the tax in the place where they're based. And that would avoid practical challenges about figuring out where you are. And so if you think that, that the internet shouldn't be accepted or exempted from internet taxes, there are ways to make sure that they're paying their fair share. You know, if a business is in one city, it makes sense that they pay taxes there because frankly, that's where that business is. They use the roads there, they use the police. It doesn't necessarily make sense that I should pay sales tax in my jurisdiction where I live. Now, there are some other questions about taxing the internet. Uh, the FCC, our communications regulator, last year, earlier this year, decided to start regulating broadband the way that we regulate the telephone network and, and the railroads and so on. And that brings with it the possibility of taxing broadband for the first time. That hasn't been decided yet formally, but it's probably only a matter of time at this point. And I think that's a pretty bad idea. It would make broadband more expensive, especially for poorer Americans. And just, just give our viewers a, uh, a very brief um, uh, explanation what is broadband and why is it so important? Sure, well broadband is just a general term for high capacity internet access. It originally uh, meant carrying video to your home, so that was distinct from a telephone network which only carried voice. And broadband, as the word suggests, just means that the pipe, if you will, uh, is bigger. The cable networks originally could carry a lot more traffic than could the telephone network, which has a you know, copper wire. Uh, over time, that term came to mean internet access that was faster than the old dial-up modem. Uh, so today, 
Generally, it means internet access. And it's important because, as I said at the outset, really every aspect of American life increasingly becomes dependent on the internet, and that's true for people around the world. Uh, around the world, people are getting uh, internet access, in many cases, in mobile networks. Uh, those mobile networks are becoming faster. Uh, the, the new fourth generation mobile technologies that have deployed uh, to most of the United States and are now deploying around the world allow you to get broadband speeds over a wireless connection. So in developing countries, that's a much more cost-effective way to get high-speed internet access to consumers. And it's important because it allows people to, to reach out beyond their local economy. It allows a company like Amazon in the United States, and there are companies like this around the world, to transform the way that commerce is done. It, it brings down prices for everybody, makes markets work better, and it means that services like Uber can enter markets and change the way that people think about things like uh, transportation or, or even getting a room. You can use a service like Airbnb to rent a room instead of going to a hotel. Okay, when we come back, we're going to talk with our guest about some of the, uh, some of the dangers that some people say are on the internet um, uh, use by terrorists and criminals and what government should do, if anything, to stop it. My guest again is Baron Soka. Baron is the founder of Tech Freedom. He had been a senior fellow and the director of the Center for Internet Freedom at the Progress and Freedom Foundation. Barron received his undergraduate degree from Duke University, my alma mater, and his law degree from the University of Virginia. Now there's a phrase that, that has entered uh, common discussion recently. It is net neutrality. What does this phrase mean and why does it matter to people? Huh. Well, uh, it has really become the only issue that many people want to talk about in tech policy debates, and I think that's unfortunate. It, it doesn't really have a clear meaning in the public mind. So when most people hear about it, they think about uh, broadband competition. That's something I've talked about uh, a few times. That's something that um, governments could make a lot easier. There are many things that, uh, as I've said, you could do to make it easier for a company like Google Fiber, for example, has excited a lot of people by installing a third pipe to some Americans' homes in some major cities so that you, you can choose between Google Fiber uh, or cable or telephone companies, and Google Fiber offers a much faster service because their network takes fiber right to your door, which carries a very high-speed optical signals, whereas telephone and cable companies usually rely on, uh, on copper wires or on a coaxial uh, cable that doesn't carry as much capacity. So many people think that's what the debate is about. Uh, unfortunately, it's really primarily about regulation of the Internet, uh, and, and I like to, to break it into two different pieces. So in the narrow sense, net neutrality means that broadband providers should not uh, decide what you yourself can view or access on the Internet. And if you put it that way, of course, everybody agrees. There really has never been a debate about that. Uh, broadband providers in the United States have always supported that idea. They've always been willing to uh, make that a, a commitment that they would live up to. The question has been how you enforce that. Uh, and that has bled into a second debate, which is really about the communications regulator in the United States, uh, in order to regulate net neutrality, starting to impose the, the traditional telephone system regulations. So those were traditionally imposed on our AT&T monopoly in 1913 uh, on. And that si sort of regulation really, as I say earlier, was designed for railroads in the 19th century. And it really assumes you're never going to have competition and keeps it that way. So that model of regulation, uh, which is called common carriage, uh, is the model that goes back, as I said, to the Middle Ages. It's how you regulated railroads and canals and, uh, and toll roads. That's not a very good model if you want multiple networks competing with each other. So unfortunately, that's where the debate is wound up. It, it also uh, has led to some fairly crazy uh, positions around the world where many people citing net neutrality as a principle, have said, for example, that Facebook should not be able to give you its service for free, should not uh, essentially cover the data charges that you might pay to use Facebook mobile in developing countries. That's especially problematic in countries like Turkey, countries in Africa have all experimented with that practice. 
which is commonly called zero rating, which just means you pay zero for the data you use for a particular service. Well, banning that service, banning a free service, will sound crazy to most people, uh, and it is crazy, but that's where some of this net neutrality fundamentalism or absolutism has led activists around the world. So we think there's a better path, and that essentially would say that, uh, of course, broadband providers shouldn't be able to censor what you're doing, but there are all sorts of innovative business models where if um, Turkcell in Turkey is trying to get a critical mass of users onto its, its wireless network, they need people to buy phones and start using the service, and it makes sense for them to give away Facebook or Twitter service for free. And they should be able to do that. It's just, that's a business decision they should make. We shouldn't ban those, and we should let them experiment and figure out how they can get more people online. All right, let, let, let's shift for a minute and talk about internet and security issues. Um, lots of good people use the internet, lots of bad people use the internet. Um, it is a, a vehicle for disseminating bad ideas, such as uh, recruiting for terrorists and for transferring money between criminals and all sorts of nefarious characters. What should um, uh, law enforcement be able to do on the internet in order to stop bad people from doing bad things? Right. Well, of course, nobody thinks that law enforcement shouldn't be able to, uh, to use the normal tools of law enforcement on the internet. Uh, but it should be limited by some basic principles. And in the United States, we have a constitutional amendment very near and dear to our hearts that requires that when law enforcement wants to get information that you hold, whether it's papers in a safe in your house or files on your computer, that law enforcement should have to go to a court and say that there is probable cause to think that you may be involved in a crime and that the court issues a warrant. That's a very basic principle of American law and I think a very sound one that ought to transfer around the world. That's not an inherently American idea. That's a, a way to balance privacy and security because it means that law enforcement absolutely can go get a warrant, enforce the law. But, but what they shouldn't be able to do is just go into your home and take whatever they want. And the same principles apply for computers that are in your home and they should apply for files that you have stored remotely. So if you use Gmail or Facebook or any number of internet services, you would like to be able to sleep at night knowing that the government can't just walk in, look at all of your data. So that's a very basic principle. The same principle essentially should apply for national security matters. So of course there, the issue isn't whether there's a crime being committed, but it's probable cause that you are connected in some way to a national security threat, a genuine national security threat. And that would be in contrast, for example, to the United States government and other governments around the world which have conducted blanket surveillance. They, they, they monitor every communication, every phone call, every internet use. They, they require internet companies to log everyone's access to the internet so they can go in and, and monitor what everyone's doing. That really is antithetical to the idea of internet freedom. It means that you, you can't use the internet without the government looking over your shoulder. And that will discourage people from communicating, especially about ideas that may be unpopular. It, how does this? How does the factor of speed change all this? I mean, today uh, you could have a an exchange on internet with someone in uh, um, you know ISIS headquarters in Raqqa um, uh, at the at the blink of an eye um, uh, and exchange information back and forth. Um, uh, uh, is, is it really legitimate to expect government to go to a judge and ask for a um, a warrant to, to to look at that? Well. So first of all, the speed hasn't changed fundamentally. I mean, we've been living with this since the 1990s. It's just simply a question of it being more accessible and in more places in the world. Uh, and it's not always the case that you have to do it after the fact. Of course, there are times when you should be able to monitor uh, before the fact. So if you know that there are individuals who are connected to terrorism, uh, it makes sense for the government to monitor those people. No one's saying that, that government shouldn't have those tools. Uh, what we are saying, though, is the government should not be able to monitor all internet communications just on the assumption that they might someday find someone that, that they couldn't otherwise have caught. That argument gets made here in the United States. There's really no evidence that blanket surveillance of ordinary Americans has stopped any terrorist attack or even helped the national security agencies. And indeed, it probably simply overwhelms them with data. 
so the, the needle in the haystack is an expression we often use. You know, it means that you have so much, so many things that you can't find the one thing you're looking for. That's often true here with, uh, with trying to monitor internet communications. So in many ways, it's actually better for law enforcement and for national security agencies that they focus on, on a particular threat. And, and there's one other dimension to this I should mention. It, it's very tempting sometimes to say, well, we should, uh, we should ban a certain technology or we should monitor all of these technologies so that we can catch the bad guys. Well, the bad guys are always going to go to some other service. They're gonna find something that is harder to track, that's anonymous, that is um, encrypted. So cracking down on the services that ordinary people use in order to catch the truly bad actors it is really just crazy. Thank you very much for joining us Thank on Dachle Washington. Bahava Nasilu il Nehayat Tadahil Halka min Baranamij Dachel Washington. Either Kenneth Ladekum E Estaf Sarat, O Ta Likat, Haul Hadahil Halka, Wa Hasatan, Haul Tahakum el Hukuma, Fil Internet. Arju an Torasiluni Muba Sharatan, Ala Anwen el Barid el Electroni Adeli, Inside Washington at elhura.com. Makum Robert Satlov, Shukran Lakum. What is the